this is part two of the Bandara commemorating Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh Ji, the great master. Great master was the greatest I have come across. I don't know of any greater master. I never met one greater. If I meet one, I'll let you know. As of date, he is the greatest because he, in practical terms, showed a way in which one can go back to our home, ultimate home. He showed the nature of all creation, how it has come into being. He straightened out many false concepts. He removed the cobwebs from my mind about concepts of God, concepts of spirituality. He took away superstitions from my mind. He told me superstitions don't make spirituality. Delusions don't make spirituality. Just living in a belief which you cannot examine and experience is not spirituality. Believing somebody else said something and therefore it is true is not spirituality. He took me away from all these superstitions and delusions and put me on the straight path, go within and find the truth inside. And he said exactly what all the masters have said. He removed the division of religion one from another. He removed the divisions that denomination that created within a single religion. He removed all the paraphernalia of external appearances which divides man from man and brought back the essential truth that love is one, God is one. There is no other God. There has always been only one God. There will always be only one God. There are no number of God. There is only one God. You give him any name, he doesn't become more than one. We in our folly, following our minds, create different names for the God, he remains one. He cannot make him two. He shared the experience of oneness that not only is God one, that we are all his children and part of him. That we are all one. That we are not one separate from him, that we are the same one. He made these experiences possible. He removed the delusions of psychic powers of the chakras in the body being equated with spirituality. He removed the delusion that the mind which is playing the devil's workshop should be equated with God or with the spirit. He did all this and a lot more. He said, I am not telling you these things. I want you to experience these things. And he gave a way to experience these things which a child of five years old can experience and an old man of hundred years can experience and everybody in between. Without distinction, discrimination of race, caste, color, nationality, anybody can do it. He said the message was universal for all humankind, for all time. He gave that in such an effective way. I have to call him the greatest. I never found anybody else saying that. Never found anybody else demonstrating it. Never saw anybody sharing it and putting it into one's life. He put this all into my life, made it happen. That's why we commemorate the great master. And he proved that the great master is the great master. He lives in spirit at all times, manifests in different human forms from time to time. Never disappears totally. He is not unjust. He is very generous, full of love. A loving God could not appear suddenly and then go away and say, now you fend for yourself. He is always there. These truths he shared and made it possible for us to experience. So we pay tribute to such a great master today. And then I have that further benefit of his prophecies. And his prophecies are the same which are prophecies of all the other mystics. The prophecy of the great awakening, the difference, the changes of the eras, the coming of age of this side of the world, of the globe. The shifting of the axis of spirituality from the eastern hemisphere to the western hemisphere. The changing of the face of the earth. That what was the back of the earth and was functioning like a rat race with the back to the wall to acquire and possess material ephemeral goods should now be changed by the eastern face which aspires for the real thing. For wisdom, knowledge, love, home. Real, real home. All these changes are taking place and we can see them. And I have been watching them. 
and I have been intensely happy. He made it possible for us while living in this world of misery to sustain a level of personal happiness that nothing can give. He made it possible that you can experience happiness objectively sitting on the edge of creation. He made it possible for one to travel on time, one to travel between different levels and dimensions of consciousness. He made it possible to go out of the body and fly anywhere in this world and any other world. He made it possible that we should be able to pierce these barriers of astral, causal, spiritual regions and fly personally while here in this physical body. He showed the centers in the physical body which connect in consciousness with all the experiences of all other regions. What else can one expect from a master whom we call a great master? He gave all this and then he gave with generosity his offer to reach out to every seeker. Whoever seeks him shall find. He did not say, I'll select a few here and there. Whoever seeks him shall find it, which makes it a wonderful opportunity. When I come and share all this with you, why am I so happy to be with you? Because I find that the seeking in your hearts is being responded to by the same spirit of the great master. The very master who taught me these things smiles and laughs today and enjoys the fact that the same spirit prevails today it has never become less or more. That the seeker who seeks will find. Whoever seeks will find. Not seeking for the sake of showing other people that you are seeking, but seeking within yourself. The seeking should be within oneself and intense. When you are an intense seeker within yourself, not minding who is watching or not watching, when you don't care what others are doing, he will find you. When nobody will stand beside you, he will stand beside you. There is no greater friend than a master. He proved it. When everybody leaves you, he comes up and stands next to you and helps you. When you feel weak, he gives you support and makes you walk up again. Nobody does. The world is not made like that. Friends are not made like that. The ones we are accustomed to. He is a real friend. He proved that if you want to have a real friend, it can only be the spiritual master. He also proved that the spiritual master's friendship does not end here. It goes beyond. He also proved that his path, which is the only path that all masters have given, does not require that you go on your own. He said we go together, that we fly together, we go through different regions together. He never leaves us. He is constantly with us. This relationship in that consciousness with a master makes this the most wonderful of all spiritual paths. And it's a royal path. He did not say rub ash on your body and uh, stand upside down, stand on headstand and stand with one leg in the river for ten years. He did not prescribe anything. He said the Shad Yoga is the royal road to heaven. You go like royalty. Why? Because you belong to royalty. If you are children of the king, you belong to royalty. Go like royalty. Don't get polluted by the mind and start thinking that you don't deserve that. The soul deserves royal treatment. And he gave a royal way to go. And he said, this path is the royal path. We are paying tribute to such a man. If you had met such a man, personally, physically, how much you would be filled up. And if he kept all his promises and he gave you all that he was saying, how much would you feel? You would, you would be, find it hard to contain all this as I am finding it hard to contain all this within me when I am sharing this with you. That is why this little symbol which came to me by coincidence from one of the ladies who attended upon him and retained this much after he left his body, physical body, and then when she was about to leave her physical body, sent a message to me in America. Come, there is something I have to give you. I have been instructed by great master to give you something. She called my mother in New Delhi. She called me here. I was in flight at that time over Europe. When the calls came to the United States and to India looking for me from Bibi Lajo, one of the ladies whose pictures you might see. Did you show them the pictures? No. 
Sometimes Clarence will show you the pictures because he went and met her. And she is gone in the physical body. Then she called me and I contacted her. She says, very urgent, the most important thing I have to talk to you. And I rushed to see her. I said, what is that most important thing? He said, it's the cup. This cup. This is the cup which she valued most. It was the cup that the great master used personally all these years. There's so much attached to it. There's so much vibration in it. There's so much of feeling for one who knows it. For me, this is the greatest treasure I possess. I'm willing to trade everything in this world for this one cup. It doesn't mean that it's as valuable for you. But for me, I just want to tell you how valuable this cup is. It's the greatest treasure. I keep it in the most safe safety deposit box that I can find in this country. I take it out only on this Bandara day. I lock it up there. I put it on my head. And I think it's the greatest opportunity I get. I want to share you to view this cup because it's the Bandara day of that great master we're talking about. It's a simple silver cup. But he used it 40 years. The person about whom I am talking used it. It's twisted and turned. It's very old. You can see that. But this is the, that cup which he used. I saw him using it. I saw him using it many times. This cup in my possession changes my life because of this sentiment and love that is filled in this cup. It's a symbol. It stands symbolically for the love of such a person. And if somebody said, what can you share with us? I say, I share this, that you can see it. Why? If you can see this and associate it with me, you will understand this is the love of the great master I am speaking about. His love is so great. He has given so much of that love. Once a person came to him and said, Master, I broke all the vows that I made. Master, I sinned. Master, you told me don't drink liquor and I drank whiskey last night with my friends. You told me not to eat meat and I had steaks and you told me not to do this. I did everything wrong, Master. Forgive me. And the great Master said, all right, you are forgiven. Don't do it again. And the man said, thank you, thank you. And he ran away. The secretaries and other onlookers who were present told the Master, Master, what kind of Master are you? A man breaks all the rules, he does not obey you, he disobeys you, and then he comes to you and he says, forgive me, and you forgive him so easily. Master said, what can I do? He has asked for forgiveness. He came and asked for forgiveness, so I forgive him. They said, Master, but supposing he does not ask forgiveness, he does the same things again, will you forgive him? I will still forgive him. Even if he does not ask for forgiveness, you will still forgive him? He said, I will still forgive him. He said, but supposing he breaks your rules repeatedly, will you still forgive him? I think I will still forgive him. Master, when will you punish him? He said, don't you see? He is carrying a mind with him, which punishes him all the time. Why should I add on to the punishing? <laughs> Why don't put me amongst those who are punishing? Let me stay on the side of forgiving. It is hard for us tuned to mental notions of justice. It is hard for us to understand the forgiving nature of these masters. When we seek forgiveness, they forgive. When we seek forgiveness with love and devotion, they forgive so much. They forgive more than we ask for. We ask them to forgive for this lapse. They say, all right, we forgive all your previous lapses also. It's hard to understand. And when they forgive, they wipe out our karma. They wipe out our life starts changing from that moment and becomes different. This kind of forgiveness, very hard to see in practice. But you see the masters doing it and they forgive. Therefore, we should ask for forgiveness. And we should ask for forgiveness and ask with love and devotion and submission. And these masters have the generosity to give it. They are the personification of the spirit. They are the personification of the word. They are word made flesh. They are word in a form of a body like us. They are the same word of which it is said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It's that word that they are personifications of. They are physical personifications of that word. 
You can imagine what that word is. The greatest power. There is no power that exists equivalent to that word. Somebody asked Master, Master, your real form is Shabbat. And you must be having a lot of that. So, why don't you give some of it to the people around? And they can all go back home. After all, you have a lot of it. And he laughed. He said, you don't know what that power is, that Shabbat. It's an ocean. One drop of that ocean is enough to take the entire creation back home. What are you talking about? Sharing a lot of that Shabbat to take one person home? You don't understand the nature of that. And here when we talk of perfect living masters, we are not talking of learned wise people who have acquired knowledge about these things. We are talking of the word made flesh. We are talking of that power personified and come here for our sake. They don't walk in our midst for their sake. They are here in that form for us, for the seekers. And how do they come? They come into our life by coincidence. I have asked so many people. I thought I found the master by accident. I find everybody finds by accident. Nobody ever found by seeking. Seeking is inside and he comes by accident. We are talking to him inside our hearts and he is coming and answering from outside. This is not possible except when he finds us. When we are ready, he finds us. If we are not found, we are not ready. Let us be ready. Let us then prepare for being ready. There is nothing else we can do. We can ask for forgiveness. We can prepare to get ready and look up to the master that he will come when the time is right. But don't look at him with preconditioned mind, with superstition, with mental concepts. Mental concepts like the mind are great barriers to spirituality. We may have a concept that Jesus Christ will come again and will wear the clothes that he wore at his birth or when he was young or when he was walking and he will come here wearing those clothes, have a beard like this and he may just pass by us in a modern suit and we may never recognize him. Because we are developing on a, dwelling on a concept, not on who is Jesus, we don't even know. We should first find out what is meant by the spirit of Jesus, how is he the same word? That was made flesh. If we can find out the truth about Jesus, we won't miss him. Because when he comes and talks to us, we know he got the answer to our question. But if we are looking for concept, we will miss him. So therefore, these mental concepts, these masters come and they brush them aside. They know they are blockades for us. We have so many blocks in our way. This is one of the blocks that we cannot accept God except in the form we want to paint him in. We cannot accept the master except in the image we have of him. He may not have that image. What image will he have? What image has he had in the past? What kind of image did God have when he became man for our sake? In known history, he became an ordinary man like us. He became so ordinary. He became more ordinary than the ordinary man. Why did he become so ordinary? So that we could crucify him, so that we could make him carry the cross, so that we could kill him, so that we could heap all the insults on him. Is that why he became ordinary? Why should he become? He, he had the power to become anything he liked. He had the power to come forth like God and say, I am the real power, you can touch me. He didn't do that. He came and became so ordinary that we should be able to deal with him as if he is more ordinary than us and we can do what we like with him. Why did he do that? And not once. Every time. Every master. Why should this happen every time? Because when we find that the real method which the masters use with us is love and mercy, they have to become ordinary like us for us to experience that love and mercy. There is no way a human being experiences love except with an ordinary human being. We have never experienced love with anybody except an ordinary human being. There is nobody I have gone around the world trying to find somebody must be there existing who loves angels and gods or who loves supernatural beings. I have found hundreds of people who are frightened of these supernatural things. 
hundreds of people who worship them, hundreds of people who admire them, hundreds of people who stand in awe for them, hundreds of people who put them on a pedestal and say they're very high, but I have not come across even one who loved them or could receive the love. The love was an experience reserved for ordinary persons, ordinary human beings. God becomes an ordinary human being so that we can experience that love. That is his way. Again and again they have come like ordinary human beings and dwelt amongst us for our sake, not for their sake, so that we can experience that love and they can take us back home. So when they move in our midst, in their ordinariness, they sometimes baffle us by their ordinariness. The more we test them, the more ordinary they come out. And when we stop testing them, the more supernatural they come out. They keep on changing their method to suit our needs at that time. So when such ordinary persons move around amongst us and they give us what we need and they find us when we are ready, that's the luckiest moment of our life. I have sometimes tried to find out what is the best luck that can befall a person in this world. In this creation, if somebody says, I am very lucky, I win in the lotteries, that's not too good. I win a, uh, won a sweepstake, or I got this. All the things put together don't equal one good luck, one event of good luck, and that is to be able to see the master face to face. Just being able to meet him once is the greatest luck that can come to us in this world. Only once. If you happen to get the chance of seeing a perfect living master only once, your account with this world is over. You belong to him. If you see him only once, your account with this world is over. The rest is only a matter of time and making arrangements to go back home. He's finding you, making you ready, giving you the right uh, inputs, making you feel now you need, now you don't need, going over your mind. All those steps go automatically. But one, one look at a perfect living master in a physical form is good enough. That's where the account ends. After that, if there is something still a matter of great good luck, while we are still on the physical plane, and that is to be accepted by him when he says, all right, I accept you or I initiate you. When a person is so lucky to be initiated or accepted by a master, then not only is the account over, there's a time limit set. You won't be here too long. You have to go back home now. So the time is set. A few short lives, maybe three or four lives which are short con considered to the millions of lives you've been roaming around here. <laughs> Few short lives and you can go home. <clears throat> Great master used to say, no seeker who is once accepted by a perfect master will ever be reborn into this world more than three times thereafter because in four lives at the most he must go out and not be reborn again in this physical universe. My father, who was a very devoted follower of Great Master and uh, loved to sometimes joke with him, he went running to Great Master one day. And he said, Master, I heard that in the discourse today, where I was not present, you said that an initiated disciple will not have more than four lives. Is that true? And the Great Master said, yes, I did say that, but that's not meant for you. This is your last life. Why are you worried about four lives? And my father said, No, but I came to ask for a few more extra lives. <laughs> I said, I don't want to go away in four. He said, My father said, I want to stay longer if you are going to be around. I don't want to go back home and you say, I am still on a trip to the physical universe. I'd like to stay on here. Then the great master explained, he says, four lives does not mean that everybody initiated goes through four lives. Four is the extreme limit. If a person is initiated by a perfect living master and follows the instructions that the master gives to the best of one's ability, this is the last life. If the person makes good while in the physical body and can have inner experiences in meditation, 
fine. If not, after this physical experience, after death, there is no rebirth. The stage by stage growth takes place from within. Such a person goes to the astral, causal and higher stages within and never comes back, never goes down. If a person who is initiated by a master does not follow the instructions of the master and skips the instructions, does not do meditation, does not do other things, then he may have to come for one more life, for the second life. But if a person totally gives up the path and says this is not true, he says, I don't believe in it anymore, I give it up, I don't care. Such a person may have to come in the third life. But if a person goes against the master, insults him, crucifies him, kills him, then only he has to come in the fourth life. I told my father, what are you talking about four lives? This is the extreme we talk of. Once you found a master, you taken care of. I am mentioning this to you because some people in this country think that four lives is the minimum. When I first came to Harvard and met some seeker who knew great master also, and those who had been uh, initiated by proxy and had not really had a chance to personally meet masters, they gave the impression that this is the normal rule. We have to be here four lives. So they were always prepared for four lives. And I said, how do you know this is the fourth life or not? They still thought three more are coming. They regulated their life always that there are three more coming. I said, then it will be endless. If every life you have to have three more, <laughs> you are going to perpetuate this four life business. So I had to mention the story. And now again I say, this four life is not the rule. It's the exception. Once we are seeking, he, he takes more steps than we do. If we take one step towards the spiritual home, he takes at least 10 steps to come towards us. People in meditation have seen this, that when we make a small move inside, he makes a big move towards us inside. So therefore, he is more keen than we are. It looks like he is a real seeker and he is a finder because he finds us and he wants us back home because we are part of him. Who are we really? as souls. We are, we are him, experiencing an individuated form here. How did this happen? So many stories have been written to justify Genesis, to justify the creation of this world, to justify why we are here. They are all different approaches to the same thing. But the fact remains, we are as souls somewhere that we don't belong. That by associating with the mind, and the senses and the body, we have got trapped in an experience, in an environment which is not our own, which is not the best for us and we have to get out of it. The great master used to tell the story of a king who had a daughter, lovely daughter, the princess. And the king said, my daughter, the princess, will one day marry a prince and live in a nice kingdom of her own. And he was very happy and made all the preparations for the princess. But the princess, instead of falling in love with the prince or going out to his kingdom, fell in love with a scavenger from the street, a man who had nothing, a pauper. What do you call those guys? Bum? <laughs> Bum on the street, no home. He had no place to go. And such a person, the princess, instead of consorting with the prince, was consorting with him. And the father was very sad. She is a delicate princess. She is used to living in a palace with all the luxuries and comforts of the palace. And how is she going to live with this guy? But then he said, at least it is love. Maybe out of love they will overcome the hardship of this kind of living. But when the princess came to this guy, he was no lover either. He didn't love her at all. While she fell in love with him and followed him, and went out of the palace, he didn't love her at all. He was loving prostitutes in the street. And not one or two, five of them. <laughs> he ran into one, then the second one, third one. All his attention was on those prostitutes. It's terrible life. Whichever one wanted, called him, come on, I want you today. And he would run there. And what is the plight of the poor princess? Great master said, that is the plight of our soul. This soul, belonging to the kingdom, the palace of the Lord, 
instead of marrying another soul and living in the luxury of such khand in the true home on an island of its own, a kingdom of its own, had decided to come down into the realm of the mind, the ephemeral realm of the mind and has married the mind. And the mind doesn't love the soul at all. The mind loves senses, not one of them but five of them. Whichever sense wants, takes the mind and the attention out. What is happening to the poor soul? Is suffering along with this mind senses network. This is our plight. Therefore, it is not our home. This is not where we belong. That is why we have to get out of here. And the masters come and they take us back to where we belong, which is our real home. We have associated so long with mind and senses and body here and physical world here, we've forgotten our true home. We don't even know how to go there. Supposing in the middle of the night, in this Mekwan near the lake somewhere we get lost while having a walk. Sometimes we have a walk and we can keep thinking of something and walk into the darkness and get lost. Then we get lost and how will we find our way back? Normally, if you are lost in a forest, in a large jungle, the best way to find the way back is to look out if there is any light of any town or city somewhere. If the lights shine, at least you can fix it is uh, your direction. If you have a light with you, you can even watch your footsteps. Your flashlight, torch, fire, a matchstick, you can light it and see your footsteps and go there. If you hear the sound of cars, automobiles, planes, you know there may be an airport there, there may be a city there, there are some sounds. The light and sounds can take a lost person back to where he belongs. The masters give the simple example and great masters used to give the simple example that when we are lost in this darkness and this forest, we can find our way back by using the light and the sound which comes from our true home and our civilization. And he pointed out that the word that created everything is a sound, can be heard, can be listened to and is light and can be seen. Therefore, our power of listening and seeing transcends the power of the body, transcends the power of senses, transcends the power of the mind and continues to be the power of consciousness right to the home. So if we lose all other senses, we will still have the sense to see and the sense to hear right to the end. Therefore, if we want to find our way back home, we can use the same method. Listen to the sound coming from within, from our home and use the light in the distance and the light that we have with us. Use the light with us and the light from the distance. The master is the light with us. When we go in meditation and when we close our eyes and it is dark, in the darkness if you want to find the way, listen to the sound, not of your mind, sound coming from your home. And that sound reverberates, can be heard, inside by each one of us. That sound is not planted by somebody. These mystics and masters don't come like the like the water diviners. You see the water diviners, the dowsers, they have a stick and they can say there is a well here. There is water under this uh, ground or they can find metals or gold or silver. So these dowsers don't first go and bury the gold and then come and call us. Look, we tell you where the gold is. They have it. They have a certain uh, talent. They have a talent by which they can spot where the gold is. The masters are like that. They don't hide sound inside us and then say, now listen inside and you will hear the sound. The sound is already there. But they have a talent to tell us how to find it inside. So when we put our attention inside and we draw from outside, we hear the sound inside. We all hear the sound. The sound that comes from our home is very melodious. It's very beautiful. It rings like bell. It rings with the same tone. Dong, dong, dong. It's got a resonance and it has got a pull. It's got a, it's got a very fantastic kind of intoxicating effect that sound has got. And that sound comes from within. When the sound comes, the light also comes from there. Bright white light. Light that pulls us towards the same sound. And if we have the master 
in imaginative form, in his radiant form, in his astral form, inside, he is very bright and shining. This combination is enough to take us back home. The master's radiant form within, the sound of the bell that you can hear, and the light in the distance is enough. Anybody who has this combination within in meditation is on the way back home. There is no stopping. His masters come and give this way. All masters gave this. All religions had this. Every spiritual discipline had this. What did we do? We didn't go inside. Neither we looked for the radiant form of the master. We still believed the master has gone away. And we have to have faith in some old master. We didn't go inside to look for the sound. We put up the bells in our churches, in our temples. And began to pull to create the sound of the bell. Never realizing that bell is sounding continuously. Nobody is pulling at it. And we didn't look for the light inside. We put the candles and the earthen lamps of our own making. And they would, candle would finish, the wax would finish, the wick would finish. We put more candles. Little realizing that that light never finishes. What was supposed to be inside? What is inside? What is still inside today? We tried to put it all outside. And all the attention went outside. And we went into symbols of the reality rather than the reality. But the masters came again and again. They came again and again and told us, go within, the light is still there, sound is still there, the bells are still ringing. Go and listen to them. If you listen to the sound, it will pull you. It is not like ordinary sound. So this method, which great master called the Sut Shabd Yoga, which means the union with the Lord, through the putting of attention on the sound. This, he says, is the royal road. And whoever has followed it has gone in a royal way like a prince back to the kingdom and has not had to suffer like a pauper on the way. With this kind of message that the masters gave us, we wasted our time on the outside and did not take full advantage of it. Today, I am showing you this cup. I am going to hide it now. Because it's my possession, my treasure, the physical, I can't carry it with me. It will probably go to somebody else. Somebody will hold this cup. I'll have to part with it. I have to part with the body. Everybody, we are all sitting here. We are not permanent in our physical bodies. We have to give up our body. We have to give up uh, our friends. We have to give up everybody that we see around. But there is something we never give up. The spirit, the soul never dies. The astral form, the radiant form of the master never dies. When we manifest that form of the master within, that form stays with us all the time. Sometimes people say, it's hard to get time from a master because he's a human being. And he, once people find out he's around, so many people start gathering around him, we can't get time from him. But we forget that we are talking only of the physical manifestation. We love the physical manifestation because through that love, we are able to manifest the radiant form of the master inside. So we go within and see the same master inside, shining. And he talks to us and gives us all the answers we want and becomes our constant companion. We can talk to the master 24 hours, day and night, when we manifest him inside. Of course, it is his grace when we get that. It is His grace, therefore, we should beg for His grace. It is His mercy. Why is it His mercy? Because if we find what we have done to deserve it, we may not get anything. If we look at our own life and our actions, and we say, we have done good, good deeds, then somebody can come and point out, what about those deeds? They are also yours. We don't deserve it. In the epic, in the Sanskrit epic of uh, Mahabharata, in which Krishna gives the discourse to Arjun, called the Gita. In that epic, there was one very holy man who had the power to see his past lives. And he made sure he never does something wrong. He said, I will never make any mistake and I will commit no sin and I will through righteousness escape from here. When he was born in the period of Krishna, he was born blind. And he was very, very sad. And he told Krishna, he says, you are a spokesman for the truth. How come 
I have the power to look back into my own past lives. I have not stopped at one or two lives. I have gone 100 lives of mine. And there is nothing I did to be blind now. And Krishna said, go a little further. In the 104th life, it came up that he did something for which he has to be blind. He said, this karma is not confined to this life or that life. It, you carry it forever. And if you look at it from that point of view, what can we deserve? What will we get? If we stand on our merit and say, Lord, we stand on our merit. We have done good deeds. Now come and give us your grace and your blessing and your mercy. He says, look back. Just see yourself. See what you did. See how often you listened to your mind. See what all you did with your mind. And then come back to me. We'll never go back. So we know we are weak. And we know our weaknesses. We know that we need forgiveness. We know that we don't deserve. Therefore, if we don't deserve, then what can we get? We have to bank upon love and mercy. We have to ask for love and mercy. That is why love and mercy is the thing that we have to beg for. That is the answer to our immediate problems. And he is merciful. He is forgiving. Therefore, a clever, a clever mind can also be convinced like this. Look, you want to stand on your ego and say, I didn't do anything wrong. I deserve this. And that is cheating. That is not real. It's hypocritical. Therefore, you won't get anything. Why don't you change and say, I want love and mercy. And you know he's always merciful and forgiving. And he will forgive you and be merciful and you get everything. A mind can come to a point when you accept it. Till that point, the ego will fight it out. No, I don't want to accept. I don't want to accept. But when the mind accepts, the mercy and the love flows immediately. We are strangely poised in a world with our ego. The same ego is helpful to us in making us seekers. And the same ego is the obstruction in saying, I can do it. The same, same ego wants to go to the Lord and the same ego says, I have to put in my effort. The same ego is willing to surrender to the Lord and the same ego says, I have surrendered and therefore makes surrender nullified. This is a strange ego. This ego, this individuation, the individual way in which we are operating here is both a blessing and also a curse. We are trapped here because of this ego and the way out is also this ego. One of the Indian saints says, said this is the answer. He says the most chronic disease human beings have is the disease of ego. And the remedy, the medicine for that disease is also within it. If you crush the ego, you will never get well. Ego is a disease and the remedy for the disease is within the ego. That turn that ego which is coming in your way into seeking and you will find the remedy. Surrender fourfold. They say, don't surrender generally. I want to surrender to the Lord. Lord, your will be done. Now I, will you tell me what your will is? That's not the kind of surrender. It's not a general surrender. Surrender fourfold. How? First, surrender your body. Don't say, I am lazy. I can't get up in the morning for meditation. It's so hard. If you have an obligation to do meditation, obligation to follow a certain discipline, do it. Don't make excuses for the body. Surrender of the body means to adopt meditation irrespective of what happens to the body. Then surrender wealth. By surrendering wealth, it doesn't mean go and throw it out into the lake. Surrendering wealth means, and as we practice, they become even more easy. But if we don't practice them, and we just stop short of practicing and say, now I know everything. I don't have to do anything. Then the same thing becomes complex again. The spiritual path is very simple if you keep on following it. It becomes very complex if you want to stop and say, let me analyze first. What exactly? How does it operate? How does it work? Well, you can stop. The master says, certainly go ahead. If we have an intellectual question about this path, we must get an answer to that question. You cannot brush away the question. 
Some people say the path of surrender means if you have questions, push them aside. It's a matter of faith. This is not a, spirit, not a scientific inquiry. It's a question of faith and the question remains in the head and we try to meditate, we try to proceed on the path. Nothing happens because the question keeps on hitting from the side. You haven't answered me yet. You haven't answered me yet. He says, shut up, I am on my spiritual path. He says, but how can you go on a spiritual path? Give me my answer. So therefore, an unanswered question in the head, an intellectually asked question, unanswered in the head is a block and will not let you go. You must get the answer. Therefore, you must get answers to all your questions. When you have got the answers to all your questions, then go ahead. Once somebody asked the great master, master, these intellectuals who come to you and ask so many questions, do they benefit by the answers you give them? He said, they benefit a lot. Because if they get their questions answered to the satisfaction of their mind, the faith that follows is very strong. But those who try to brush their questions aside and say we are going to live on faith, that faith is very shallow. One wrong thing happens, something happens not to your liking and the faith is broken. But when a person has got the intellectual questions answered and then builds up his faith, it may take more time, but that faith becomes unshakable. Therefore, it is better to get your questions answered and then have unshakable faith rather than quickly try to have faith in something and things don't happen the way you want and the faith is broken. So he said there is a place even for the intellectual questions that come in our life. Get all the questions answered and if you still have more questions, get them answered. If you need more time, take more time. But don't let a question hit you from the side and interfere with your progress later on. So there is a place for all this in the teachings and they are very simple. We should go step by step, take advantage of all that the masters want to share with us. We have some pictures. You have some pictures? Would you like to take a picture? I want to give you uh, a picture of great master also as a commemoration of his presence today. So I'll uh, in a few minutes, bring out the pictures and uh, distribute them to you. If you want uh, to get the signature, we'll do it later, right? To conclude this part two, let us live in the love and mercy of the Master. Let us realize our own shortcomings. Let us not try to be too haughty and stand on our own merits. We don't have them. Let's be honest. Let's be honest and look into our own hearts and see where we really stand and admit it. And when we admit where we stand and we know our own life, we know our own mind, we know our own actions, we know our own omissions, then it's best to seek the love and mercy of the Master. And he will give the love and give mercy and forgiveness more than we can expect. So better to ask for it now. Let's ask for the mercy. Beg for the mercy. This is the time to beg for mercy. So he wipes out so much of the cobwebs and karma and gives us a clean slate to work on. It's a good time to beg for mercy. Beg for love and mercy. 